G'day folks, welcome to this uh, overview of Triumph of Chaos version 2, the Deluxe Edition. This is designed by David Doctor and published by Clash of Arms Games. This is quite a long overview. It includes a four and a half minute unboxing at the start. You'd rather skip that, just uh, fast forward to the five minute mark where I begin to uh, go over the, the new components, the new map, uh, and begin to analyse the, the art, uh, the new leaders and so forth. If you'd rather skip that, you can go straight to my final thought. You can skip to the, uh, at the 13 minute mark. Okay, so let's have a look inside the box and at the components. Now, uh, I don't know if you pick this up on the video, but this is a, a nice textured box, a lot like Clash of Arms' uh, uh, La Bate de Dresde. Uh, nice textured cardboard, very sturdy and solid. We have the faction control table, which will indicate uh, control of the various factions throughout the game. The various uh, what is this? city control and supply, the fronts, this is indicating the, uh, the front lines between two uh, um, adjacent areas, control by opposition, nice little cardboard game, uh, postcard game. Now we have a few decks of cards. Uh, you've got the political deck here by the looks of it. This is what they look like. We have the action decks, red and white, with an idea of what they look like. You can see the ops. Their uh, period of entry, 1918, 1918, white, red. Uh, the events. And then we have the uh, leader cards. Okay, um, some turning point simulations adds a. I don't know what this is. Ah, oh, is this a summary? I believe of the factions, white factions reinforcements. Clash of arms advertisement. A summary of the components. And changes from version one. So if you're upgrading from version one to version two, this deluxe version. Uh, red reinforcements, quite a lot of those. White reinforcements. The combat table and mechanics. This is about two, uh, two A4 pages. We have, let's have a look at the uh, counter sheets. They are thick. Let's pop one out. Can I pop one out and have a quick look? There you go. Nice, sturdy, colourful. Three sheets of those. This is a, um, a glossy. Uh, it's, it's black and white, but uh, high quality and uh, glossy print. That is a supplement. That is a rule book. They're both the same um, quality paper. Um, thirty-two pages and thirty-two pages. You need both to understand. The game. Yes, this covers uh, these scenarios and the uh, political phase and factions. There you are. And do I see? Yes, there's an example of play. Towards the end there, pages 28 and 29. Okay, and then the maps. Um, now again, this, I'm, I'm going to open these up, but uh, these are the nice textured Clash of Arms maps, very similar to, in fact, I think it's identical paper stock to their Labate series of games. So if you're familiar with those, uh, this is not thin cardboard, this is actually quite um, 
well, it's car. It's it's a, a thick textured paper, um, quite thick and uh, yeah, good quality. Let's have a look. Okay, so here are the two maps together. Again, this is quite thick uh, textured paper, uh, but it looks amazing. This is a uh, a lot clearer than the uh, the original version of the game. In particular, those uh, cities really stand out. So you can see how these cities really stand out. They pop out from the map much uh, much more so than the original. Um, the locations, the other locations, are much clearer in terms of their terrain. Uh, the the railroads and the roads. There's a clearer distinction between the two. The the boundaries between the regions are it's probably more subtle um, but it gives greater attention to the different areas on the map so here's what the map looks like all set up and ready to go there's again two maps here split uh, along this line I've got a sheet of plexiglass just over the top to keep it flat mainly let's zoom in and uh, have a look at the details Okay, so here we are looking at the southern Don Kuban region, eastern Ukraine over here. Um, and if you're familiar with the first edition, you'll notice already, uh, well I think, how much clearer this is. The Victory Point cities now are quite large um, visual images, whereas all the other hexes are just small circles, and that makes it much clearer to differentiate these Victory cities at a quick glance. The terrain in these circles is now a thousand percent clearer, uh, you can very easily gauge the differences in the terrain just with a quick glance. The uh, the railroads, the roads and the secondary roads are again very clear. Um, what else? So another, another main difference is the um, size and the graphics on these counters. Um, the armies are now these large rectangular shaped units. The core are still small units. Uh, this... this... Uh, is probably a main difference in the aesthetics. Let me zoom in and show you. Okay, so here's the situation uh, just sort of northeast of, of Rostov. Uh, the second deluxe edition comes with these sort of front blocks to kind of help you visualize the front lines um, between the opposing forces. And I think this is, this is good. Um, I think it certainly helps, um, partly because with these large rectangular counters, they, they do overlap the small circles. They can be quite easily bumped about. And at times, you can see these guys here, up actually up there. At times it can be hard to kind of figure out, I'm actually get rid of that one. Figure out at a glance where the units are. In the, in the first edition, whilst these all kind of blended in together, it was hard often to differentiate the roads. That's been much, made much clearer, but the rectangular forces now kind of uh, blend into one another a little bit and you do have to be very careful like this unit here on this sort of this primary road but yes it has the potential to be confusing um, to be bumped so whilst I think the map is clearer um, the map art is clearer the I think it's just mainly the, the shape of the counters that I have issue with and that's probably just because it's so unconventional what I do love is the art on these counters. They are historically thematic. Um, they look amazing. Let me show you some of the other ones up the top. So here we have some of these Czech Legion units. Um, Siberians. And then over here, Siberian Cossacks. Uh, the Socialist Revolutionaries don't look too exciting, but then you've got the, the Reds. Um, this is a reduced red unit, but let me show you that art. So lots of flavor on the units. It's very um, flavorful, I suppose. Uh, every different sort of um, regional army and corps has this slightly different art. So all these, the the, 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 um, the Cossacks, uh, Siberian Cossacks and Siberian regular forces are all white forces, but they have slightly different art on them. Uh, for new players, this can be confusing and hard to grasp, but um, I guess that's part of the, the learning curve. And a lot of that art can be seen at a glance on the faction control table. You can see the uh, indication of what the armies look like on the left here. 
Um, again, just for those new players, these shift left or right to show faction control. So Markno, for example, um, can shift towards white control, and white gained control of his forces. So of course, victory cities are indicated by these cubes. Resource centers are indicated by these barrels, and this indicates the, um, I guess the factory or resource level, which enables forces to bring on replacements and, and so forth. Uh, leaders are of course shown by these leader counters, uh, and they have special abilities shown. There are also these leader cards, uh, and these these are not required, but they kind of um, you can you can lay these out, and it summarizes the. Uh, the abilities of these various leaders. So I've got Trotsky down here in Camp Trotsky, Stalin up here in Camp Stalin, Lenin way up in Moscow who starts wounded, all the various red victory cities, uh, red resource centers, connections from railroad, uh, river crossings, what else do we have, different terrain types. It all, again, the, the, these, these changes are all we can think of them as pretty subtle, but they really help the uh, the terrain features pop out on the map and make it very clear at a glance where everything is. Okay, so apart from those sort of aesthetic visual differences, what are some of the main differences between the two editions? Uh, not a huge deal. If you're familiar with the first edition, you will very easily uh, be able to pick this up and play it immediately. You'll notice almost straight away the presence of those socialist revolutionaries on the board. Uh, they now create some space between the reds and the whites up in that uh, top northeastern part of the map, and they can swing uh, between red and white potentially, leaning white but potentially swinging red. Um, some of the action cards have changed. The leaders, of course, are different. They now have a reverse side of their counter. In the original edition, these were square, and the back side of the counters just showed that a leader was done. Uh, now they show a potential alternative state. So Kolchak could have uh, suffered from drug abuse. Um, Lenin has that wounded side, uh, and so forth, just to make it a little bit more interesting. The Far East... On the far right of the map has been modified. Uh, it's kind of an abstract representation of what's going on in the Far East with Japan. Uh, I think there's some socialist revolutionaries out there and other units. Um, and aside from that, there's just a lot of little tweaks to some of the political rules for these factions that can come into the game. Uh, some minor tweaks to combat, such as the way tanks and air units and so forth are used. But by and large, it's the same game. Uh, it just looks so much better. It looks amazing. Um, for those who haven't played the game, what is it like to play? It is <laughs> a triumph of chaos. The, the name of the game is a description of what it's like to play. It is chaotic. It is frustrating. It is tense. It is angst-inducing. There are so many bad things that can happen to you. So if you're one of those people who get really frustrated when you roll a 1 on a dice... Brace yourself, because so much can happen uh, over the course of play. Now, gameplay runs over three main phases. There's a political phase where you're basically playing cards to try and influence factions towards your side. Sometimes you get to choose cards um, to focus on, for example, you want to swing Ukraine towards you. You can focus on specific cards that help with that, but you don't know what your opponent is playing, and then these random cards come out, and they can mess up all your plans, or your opponent could inadvertently help you by, for example, ignoring Ukraine, and so Ukraine swings heavily towards your side. It's um, almost like a game of rock, paper, scissors with a dose of sort of tactical engagement, because you have a, a say in what cards you're picking and how heavily you invest in this political phase. Now, with that over and potentially new factions entering the game, you move to the action phase where basically you're moving, you're using your hand of cards, much like common card driven games like Paths of Glory, uh, Here I Stand, and so forth, to move your mainly your military units on the board. You can move, engage in combat, try and capture territory, revolving around mainly those victory cities, but also the resource centers. Uh, in this game, there is potentially a lot of uh, move, maneuver. Um, and in particular, cutting off enemy units from supply. Now, unlike Paths of Glory and a few other games, cutting off a unit, an enemy unit doesn't 
uh, freeze them in place. Uh, it is not as disastrous as Paths of Glory. Instead, those units can still move. It just costs more to move them. Um, it's, it's not something that you want to happen, but it is not quite as disastrous. And in fact, one of the very first turns, on the first uh, first turn, first action phase of the game, the whites uh, will typically elimi uh, put out of supply two red armies. And this way down in the south in uh, Kuban region. And this gives red sort of some really difficult decisions to make. Do they abandon those red armies and say, whatever, they're dead? Do they invest heavily in ops to move them north and try and get them back in supply? Uh, do they really make this a focus of their fighting to eliminate those white units? Uh, almost immediately, there are some really tough decisions to make for both white and red players. Um, so you're manoeuvring these forces, much like Paths of Glory, point-to-point -point movement throughout these various spaces using those roads uh, and railroads um, and capturing these VC cities. Then you get to the third phase, which is basically a logistics phase where you can you know, pay for the new leaders to come on, you update supply, a kind of an administrative phase of the game. Now the narrative of the game is that Red starts off with this central location, interior lines of communication, um, but they are kind of outnumbered by the whites, and there's this international intervention kind of on its way. These European powers, France, Britain, uh, will, will lean towards white and will most likely come in and intervene on the side of white. So Red is outnumbered from the start, but gradually through card play, through event play, instead of moving their armies around, they will build up their reinforcements and build up more forces and try to slowly stem the white tide and then hopefully push them back and recapture territory. So it's this kind of swinging momentum gradually throughout the game. That's generally how it might go, but of course it is so chaotic uh, that the card you want doesn't come out. Uh, Ukraine might swing towards your opponent suddenly and now you're rushing forces away from you know, the Don front to deal with them. Uh, you don't know what your opponent's plans are. They may be heavily investing in, uh, who knows, uh, Lithuania, uh, Belarus, to bring them onto the board. Uh, you're, you're, you know, you've got a plan, you're trying to stick to it, but uh, so much can undo that. And yes, as I said, this can be frustrating, but it also creates this fascinating and exciting and engaging narrative uh, between you and your opponent. Having look, all of that said, the beautiful map, this is an outstanding game. I love Triumph of Chaos. I love the chaos. If you just embrace that chaos and accept that things will go wrong and your army marching along this secondary road, planning to get to a victory point city, will suddenly stop on this secondary road because they fail their movement roll. Uh, all the reinforcements that you were hoping to bring in just don't appear and you're under attack and you're going to lose Moscow. Just embrace the chaos, accept the chaos, and f flow with the game and what it brings. And you know, with an opponent, share this this, this great story of how the uh, the white armies marched north from the Don to capture Moscow, and how your forces were defeated. Um, I, 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 it is a long game. It is a I think a sixteen turn game. It plays um, quite slowly over the course of probably 10 hours. So if you, you know, if you're sitting down one day, expect a long day, if not a long weekend. Um, but as I said, tr it, it's not the type of serious, uh, it's a heavy game. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it is, I'm trying to encourage people to approach this th as, as you would here I stand, you know, where, um, you really focus on the narrative that develops. Um, I think if I was playing this as a tournament game, I would be very frustrated. Don't get me wrong, a good player will beat a bad player. It is not a random game. It is uh, quite a, compl a very complex game. But um, if you're taking things very seriously, you might get frustrated by the chaos that the game throws up. So that is Triumph of Chaos version 2 Deluxe, published by uh, David Doctor in 2019. It is available from Clash of Arms Games.